peace, friends. I'm Pastor Tom Arthur from Sycamore Creek Church in Lansing, Michigan. Whether you experience sheltering in place as positive or negative, we can all shelter in God's grace daily. Psalm 91 says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Our Daily Shelter is a live video podcast where we interview an expert in one area or topic related to COVID-19 and sheltering in place so that we can find God's grace for today. We cover a range of topics from science to government and theology to prayer. We're looking to find God's grace in each area of our lives. So let's shelter in God's grace together right now. The Old Testament chronicles many trials and tribulations of the ancient people of Israel. Pestilence and famine, death and destruction, sieges and exile. COVID-19 isn't the first tragedy to hit humanity. How can reading the Old Testament help us find God during today's challenges? Today, I'm thankful to have on our daily shelter, Dr. Ellen Davis. Dr. Davis is the Amos Reagan Kearns Professor of Bible and Practical Theology at Duke Divinity School and was my Old Testament professor during my time in seminary. I've often said that uh, Dr. Davis saved the Bible for me. I sat in her office several times, uh, pondering the deep things of life, trying to understand how to read and understand and apply the Bible to my life and the lives of those around me. My wife and I also had the opportunity to have Dr. Davis and her husband over for dinner several times while we were in North Carolina, and we look back on those times fondly, especially in this moment when you can't have people over to your house for dinner. Dr. Davis, I'd rather be sitting around a table sharing a meal with you, uh, but I'm also thankful to have you on our Daily Shelter today. Great to see you, Tom. Thank you. So before we get to the topic of the Old Testament and COVID-19, what's been your personal experience with you and your husband of uh, COVID-19 and sheltering in place? And have there been any moments of God's grace for you personally? It's been relatively easy for me personally uh, because um, I'm still able to exercise and work in the garden um, and see neighbors at least in passing on the street. Um, and I'm still able to read and write, which is a lot of what I do. So um, it's the scholar's life to, to be it, at home. It is. So um, in some ways, it's, it's probably less stressful for us as a profession than most other people. Um, it's been more challenging for my husband. He's in a very high risk category. Mm. So I am our link to the outside world. Um, and he's, he's pretty much at home, mostly inside, because in addition to COVID-19, he has pollen allergies, oh, um, no. both of which put his respiratory system at risk. Um, so that's been more difficult, but um, uh, thanks be to God, our health has been good. We are safe, and we do not feel uh, we do not feel highly vulnerable. Um, and one grace is that it is a beautiful spring in North Carolina, um, and so we're just surrounded by a tremendous amount of natural beauty. Um, I'm not sure that the birds are any more active than they've ever been, but we have more time to pay attention to them. Uh, so. Yeah, we, we had a testimony service this past Sunday. We asked different families to pre-record short stories of how they've encountered God in these two months. And one of them said that this is, has to be the most beautiful spring that she can remember which is really funny because it's been like the coldest and wettest spring that I can remember, but we've slowed down to enjoy actually seeing it. Yeah. Um, our, uh, how, how's it been teaching from home? I mean, you're, you're not, you, I'm used to seeing you standing in front of 150 right. students in a big right. lecture hall. Um, I was now. not, I actually was not teaching this term. Oh. So I did not have to make an adjustment at spring break, um, I've, a lot of the lectures I was meant to give either 
at Duke or elsewhere have been online. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had to learn to mount the Zoom curve, um, <laughs> but I didn't have to do it in, I didn't have to do it all in a week. And that was, that was a blessing. And um, in fact, I've been surprised, and I, this is another grace, um, I've been surprised at how effective uh, online communication is proving to be. Mm. So a lecture I was supposed to give that they expected a couple of thousand people to be there. It was, it was a conference on preaching and 15,000 people showed up. Wow. So, so, and it was on climate change. So, you know, you think, gee, if 15,000 people are willing to think about preaching on climate change, which was the topic, that, that could be a big grace. Um, so I'm, you know, things that I would not have gravitated toward or happily embraced, um, I'm seeing that there's, that there's another side to them. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I was, Jeremy, she was saying she's supposed to talk between 4,000 people. And then it ends up fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. And and on climate change, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we uh, I think we've all been a little surprised. I mean, it's it's sort of a mixed blessing this whole technology thing. Um, there have been real moments, at least in my own personal ministry, of connecting with people and connecting with God in unique ways um, together through this kind of technology, and other ways where we're lamenting. Um, which which brings us to today's topic. Um, the Old Testament, as you, you taught me well, I think, uh, uh, covers a wide range of experiences, situations, time frames, genres, and more. In fact, I remember you cautioning us to say, to not say, the Old Testament is all about, you know, and, and insert one word, um, but it's about a lot of things, a lot of experiences, a lot of different kinds of literature, um, a multitude of voices and authors over thousands of years. Um, and, and I think maybe in this moment, that's part of its strength, if, if it's not its strength in, in a lot of moments. So amidst that, all that variety and diversity of the Old Testament, what can we learn about finding God amidst, um, I mean, we're not really in a siege, um, but uh, there are smaller struggles of daily life that we regularly face, and then bigger struggles like this one of COVID-19. You have been well taught, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Give myself a high five there, or you a high five. Um, I think that this, the first thing that comes to my mind is that we may be in a time of listening and mm -hmm. paying attention uh, and, and looking for God. Um, more diligently than perhaps we usually do. Um, the very, very fact that we're having this kind of conversation and um, is one instance of it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've begun to wonder if in all of our grief and distress, um, which is entirely appropriate and necessary in this time, um, and also the things that we are finding, the ways we're experiencing grace, I'm beginning to wonder if in some of that we are being delivered from our, some of our abiding triviality. Hmm. Um, and abiding triviality. You're going to unpack that for us. Well, I think that when we are so busy, uh, we're inclined to think about the next thing we have to do. Um, and, and many of those things perhaps are not all that important, uh, mm -hmm. but we do them. Um, and, uh, but there's something more elemental about this time because so many of the things with which we would keep our, ourselves busy or entertained have been taken away from us. Yeah. Um, and some of what 
is left perhaps um, moves us with greater awareness into the presence of God. So where, where are the resources in the Old Testament? Where would you point us to for that kind of renewed attentiveness or that stripping of the, um, oh my gosh, the abiding trivialities? Um, the, f the first thing that, that comes to mind is the Psalms and lament because the Psalms speak in our own voice. Mm -hmm. um, and many, many of the Psalms, dozens of them, are lament Psalms exp expressing grief, loss, a sense of threat, vulnerability. Um, those tend not to be the Psalms that we hear on a Sunday morning in ordinary times um, when most often more cheerful psalms are picked, mm -hmm. um, either by the pastor or by the lectionary. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one resource. Somebody wrote to me this morning, actually, and um, recalled something that I had written some years ago but he picked a verse from Psalm 34 out of that. Um, and the verse re reads, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He delivers those whose spirits are crushed. Mm. That just came out of my e email this morning um, as one indication of what one person is thinking about. In would, you, would you say that again? It's Psalm 34. Yeah. It's Psalm 34, it's verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He delivers those whose spirits are crushed. Hmm. And he said that that verse is being helpful to me yeah. right now. Yeah. So we've, uh, the Psalms are certainly um, a place where we experience the emotion of, of humanity, the full range of it. Um, where else can we look in the Old Testament for, for some resources for that paying attention to God? The prophets, um, very many of the prophetic texts reflect the historical realities of exile for both the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Um, so starting with Amos, um, probably the earliest of the prophets, going through um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, over and over again, we are hearing about the phenomenon of exile, which is essentially the phenomenon of being cut off from everything that is familiar. Mm, yeah. Everything that appeared to be manageable under our control, um, or perhaps um, under the control of a God that we thought we knew what to expect mm -hmm. from. Um, and, and in that literature, it's, it's, never, it's never simplistic, um, but there's an uneasy sense expressed in very much of the exilic literature that as a society, we are not entirely innocent. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the, the exilic prophets exert a kind of pressure on us to reconsider our ways mm -hmm. uh, to perhaps to change our ways of thinking and living um, Changing your way of thinking is what the Bible calls repentance. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be another place that we might spend some time. Again, um, that's very complex literature that includes anger against God, 
self-reproach, um, also profound hope mm -hmm. in restoration, exile and restoration are never entirely separate. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's also, I think, a lot of comfort in that too, when you get to like the comfort, oh, comfort my people. Um, it's a, uh, there's, there's that speaking the prophetic word uh, of the Lord to bring comfort as well in the midst of exile. That's right. That's right. Uh, from Isaiah. Um, and also a, a recognition that, and this is something we're feeling in our own time, that the poor and vulnerable, the Aniva Avion in Hebrew, sometimes it's translated the poor and the needy in English, but I think I think weak and vulnerable or poor and vulnerable is a good way to render it. Um, there's an awareness that they suffer more than, the, than those who are in power, mm -hmm. uh, than those who, who are comparatively wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, so the, as I said, there are no simplistic answers, um, but there is a sense um, in which as a whole people, more than as individuals, we need to re-examine our ways. If we are to live into God's promise, which you just cited from Isaiah, God's promise of comfort. Mm, yeah. Friends, I wanna remind you that you can post your questions in the comments section on Facebook or the Q&A here on Zoom. And our executive producer, Jeremy Cracky, is paying attention to those. And he will bring uh, those questions to Dr. Davis in just a moment. Dr. Davis, I'm, I'm thinking back of kind of the convergence of those two um, moments of exile and, and the Psalms in the Psalm, like Psalm 137, um, mm -hmm. where you have, uh, how could we sing the songs of Zion in a foreign land? Mm -hmm. Which is what churches have been doing the last two and a half months, singing songs on Zoom. Is that a question or a comment? I don't know. It was, I, I guess I was, uh, it was more a comment, but uh, um, so, so we've talked about the Psalms. We've talked about exile. Give, give us, for, for those um, who are maybe, you know, one of the things I've learned being a, a pastor of a new church or newer church is I have to be, I have to really um, explain a word like exile. Um, not, that, that's, that's a foreign term in many ways to, to many people. Give us just a brief, like, nutshell history of exile in the Old Testament. Okay. Uh, there are, in the Old Testament, there are two major exiles. One happens in 722 BC or before the Common Era. Um, that's when the Assyrian Empire, which was the biggest empire anybody had ever seen uh, in the biblical world, um, came in and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and exported a lot of the population and imported people from other conquered worlds. So that that's the 10 lost tribes of Israel were not accidentally misplaced. Mm. They were sent into exile. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, what's left is the much smaller, uh, less powerful, uh, less rich kingdom of Judah. And about 150 years later, in 586, um, the Babylonian Empire comes in and destroys Jerusalem. And that especially, from a biblical perspective, um, is the thing that was never supposed to happen. Uh, so you just cited Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we hung up our liars. Um, how can we, and our tormentors, required of us a song, how can we sing um, the songs of Zion um, in a strange place? Um, Israel had to totally, Israel and Judah had to totally rethink God's promises 
to them mm. um, in that time of exile. And I often say it, you've probably heard me say it, Tom, that Israel went into exile with traditions, religious traditions, many of them written, some of them probably not written down, but it came out with something like the first draft of scripture, mm. you know, the first draft of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, mm -hmm. um, because it was a time of enormous, um, Israel came back from exile was many, many Jews never returned from Babylon. There was a very significant Babylonian Jewish community uh, for at least a thousand years. And um, the Babylonian Talmud is the major document um, that came out of that, apart from the Bible itself. Um, but Jews were allowed to return after about 60 years um, to Jerusalem. And in that 60 years, everything got rethought. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I am convinced that had it not been for that disaster, the profundity of Israel's faith in which we, to which we are heirs mm -hmm. uh, to this day, I'm convinced that it would not have had the impact that it did. Um, and that it was because yeah. of its ability to survive disaster um, that Israel's testimony to God has the impact that it does more than two millennia later. Because of Israel's ability to survive disaster. Because not, not only because of the people's ability to survive disaster, but because of their ability to survive worshiping the same God. Hmm. None of the other gods of the ancient world is worshiped today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, Marduk, uh, chief god of Babylon, um, you know, is an archaeological artifact. Uh huh. Um, but we worship the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because somehow, by the grace of God, Israel was able to rethink everything in exile and produce a testimony that had resilience. Um, the kind of resilience that enabled the followers of Jesus to still believe even after the crucifixion. Hmm. Wow. So now you've just jumped us to the New Testament, um, which, is, which is maybe a good place to hit the pause button just for a minute to get some questions in here. But um, you, wh what I'm hearing you say and something that's striking me is I'm seeing a sort of parallel right now. There is a kind of rethinking that everybody's doing about their life, a rethinking about what's important, rethinking about who God is and who God is in relation to them. Um, and there's also this incredible amount of creativity in this space as well. And, and it's, you're sort of describing a, 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 the sort of ancient phenomenon of exile for, for Israel um, of both of those things, rethinking, reworking God, and then this creative process of writing it down. So you say it's sort of the first draft of what we would consider now the Old Testament mm -hmm. coming out of that. And uh, it seems like this is a similar time um, where, where those pieces, what's, what's familiar has become unfamiliar and we're all rethinking of well, what we thought about God maybe didn't work, doesn't work anymore. Maybe it was wrong. It wasn't God that was wrong, but it, it was our way of thinking about it. And then the creative process of, of reworking that. Yeah. Um, perhaps there are some people, Jeremy, who uh, have been yes. writing some questions. Um, yeah. On Facebook or. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what do people want to ask Dr. Davis? So Dr. Davis, you are obviously living in Durham, North Carolina academic community. We're in the East Lansing, Lansing area, which is Michigan State University. And college students across the country have experienced a modern day exile. University campuses said, get out for our own safety during this COVID-19. 
how have you as a professor been able to, con to continue um, creating community with the students in whom you teach? And then how have you encouraged them, specifically those whom graduated, um, I'm assuming graduate commencement already happened and the graduating class who got their Masters of Divinity didn't get that celebration. So how has the university in particular, the, the Divinity School celebrated those whom have graduated? I'm not the best person to answer this question because I wasn't, as I think I said earlier, I was not in the middle of teaching a class this term. That's this right, happened. you did say that, yep. Yeah. But I have been fortunate. Um, the graduating students who uh, were in one of my large classes uh, three years ago when they came, um, invited me to speak to them at graduation just just briefly but it gave me an opportunity uh one that i greatly valued to um to both offer a kind of testimony a kind of witness it was as you'd expect from me it was sort of a little sermon um and at the same time um to express my regard for them um and i think that other faculty had similar opportunities in, um, in different ways. Um, I was meant to do something in the fall for alumni, which would have included the recent graduates and current students, um, a, a day of study. That's not going to happen. No, it, sorry, it wasn't in the fall. It was meant to be in March. And so they put it online and a number of my students saw that and wrote to That's me. That's great. I, you know, so there've been things like that. Yes. Another question is, uh, you know, here at Sycamore Creek Church in Lansing, we have two proud Duke alumni, Divinity School. And uh, many of us, was coming. and we've interviewed um, other uh, of your colleagues at, at the Divinity School, but the, uh, the audience really wants to know who is the better student Sarah Arthur or Tom Arthur? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. We all <laughs> actually, as I recall, Sarah. as I recall, they both did, did excellent work. But um, it's amazing to me, to tell you the truth, when the most gratifying thing to me as a teacher is when some years later my students come back to me as you did, uh, Tom, in designing this program and saying this is and say this is what I learned. This mm. is what I'd like to reflect upon now. Mm. Then one really feels that it made a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. It doesn't make I mean, as far as I can recall, they both got A's in my class, but it you know, that doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, well, he's wiping his forehead. <laughs> but I can tell you, Dr. Davis, that uh, this this platform isn't an opportunity isn't the only opportunity that Tom and Sarah respectively get to share their admiration for those who taught them. Um, we often hear of, of Tom's um, experiences there at both the good and the challenging times there at Duke Divinity. So it's really, it's really special to see someone like yourself, quote unquote, in the flesh um, and, and seeing those who have championed his intellect, but also ultimately his pastorate. And so, you know, kudos to you and thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I thought maybe she was going to say, take the baby and cut it in half and that was, <laughs> um, or something like that. Well, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for uh, joining us here and talking about um, the Old Testament today. We're, we're going to turn the corner here to our segment that we call Co-Video Conversations, um, and it starts with this. So this is the new segment of our podcast where we share a video, a meme, a photo, or something, whatever is on our minds, um, and we have a, well, conversation about it. Uh, to make it interesting, we unleash our executive producer, Jeremy, from behind the scenes, um, I sometimes regret this, to uh, lead the conversation. So Jeremy, what do you got for us today? Well, so when we talk about COVID-19 and and exile and stuff, it's maybe a little bit of a downer at times. And we, sometimes we just need to laugh. 
sometimes we just need a horse around. Hit the video. <laughs> Jeremy, you are always finding farm videos. What is it? Is this a dog or is that a cat? It is a puppy and a horse playing, legitimately playing tug of war. Have you ever seen something like this? Watch. <laughs> the one will drop it and the other one will pick it up. This is just like crazy. I mean. Like, like the lion and the lamb? Yes. Get, Look um, at that. It's uh, the horse and the dog. They're just horsing around in the dog days of summer. It looks like a cold uh, place wherever they're at because the, the horse has got like. A coat <laughs> but look on at it. that thing. I mean, I was a naysayer initially on whether a horse could play tug of war, but evidently they can. A naysayer. There you go. You got it. I can't believe you uh, didn't didn't emphasize that. Right. It is a nay a naysayer. <laughs> Dr. Davis, Jeremy has been um, fasting from the country for the whole time that he's lived in Lansing, which is longer than me. Um, and so he's constantly bringing videos from the country. Uh, yeah, to this. Just, to, just, to, just to make it feel a little bit like home, yeah. Did, did you grow up in the country or did you grow up in the city or where? where how, Neither where one exactly. Uh, I grew up on an island in the San Francisco Bay. <laughs> um, and so it was- Is that probably, Alcatraz? No, I'm just not kidding. That, I'm kidding. I'm but not very far away. Um, it was probably ten miles, as the sea, maybe less, as the seagull flies from the city. Uh -huh. um, so it wasn't really country, uh, although um, in the 1950s it was um, it was pretty rural, but not farming country. All right. Well, you may remember uh, Tim Otto, who uh, was Ooh. a fellow uh, student with me, and I'm actually interviewing him next week. He lives in San Francisco um, in a new monastic house, so I've just been curious what it's been like to shelter in place in San Francisco when you live with a whole bunch of people yeah. um, mm -hmm. versus the rest of us who've been sheltering uh, more uh, on our own. So, Dr. Davis, uh, I, I know you're not out there on Twitter and Snapchat and Reddit and so on, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I think if people want to keep up with you or at least uh, know a little bit more about some of your work, they can look you up on the Duke Divinity um, website. That's right. Um, um, and, um, and there's actually quite a lot right now um, sort of making the rounds on video. Oh, yeah. So if, if somebody searches for you on YouTube, they'll find you uh, out there? Probably. Probably. Well, they'll, they'll find this in a little bit. Um, in fact, uh, we've had several of our Duke professors' videos found uh, on YouTube by various colleagues of mine. So um, as we wrap up here today, how, how can our viewers and listeners be in prayer for you? Thank you. Um, if you would pray for um, safety and encouragement for our students, um, and I have a couple of friends who are fast approaching the end of their earthly life. Mm. Um, and, and it's a time when we can't gather around them in the way that we might have hoped that we could. So I'm particularly mindful of those two groups of people uh, with quite different needs. Okay. Thank well, you. friends, uh, let, let's take some time to pray for Dr. Davis and the networks that she uh, finds herself in. Good and gracious God, uh, in the midst of these challenges that we find ourselves in today, um, we come to you uh, seeking your grace and your mercy, seeking your love, um, seeking your chesed, your faithful kindness, faithfulness, and mercy. And we pray that for the students who are uh, under the tutelage of Dr. Davis um, that uh, perhaps didn't have the graduation they expected and are perhaps not uh, ex going through the appointment that they expected, being appointed to a church and not being able to gather to meet. We pray that the work that they have done um, and the time they've spent uh, studying uh, the Old Testament under Dr. Davis would come to provide resources for themselves and for the communities that they lead. 
God, we also pray for those who uh, continue to mourn or, or are in the process uh, of mourning. Um, and Lord, we recognize again that uh, we are in a foreign land trying to do something that uh, was familiar at one time, something as what seems simple now was a funeral and now is just a very complex. Um, and Lord, as we, as we turn to you, we, we pray for your mercy upon us and upon those who are making the transition from this life into whatever the next chapter is that you have for them. God, we thank you for the time that Dr. Davis has spent with us today, continuing to teach us, continue to share the wisdom and your wisdom um, that we read in the Old Testament. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit and all who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Friends, will you join me in giving Dr. Davis some love in the comments section and thanking God for her? There are a couple of things that I want you to be aware of. Our Daily Shelter is a midweek podcast and we host live shows on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and they're usually at 3 p.m. You can join us live at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash ODS, which is how you get into the Zoom room, or you can always catch them afterwards on our Facebook page. We do uh, stream it to Facebook. I know many of you are out there right now. While you're on our Facebook page, would you uh, like the page? Um, and that way you'll be in touch and be in the know of everything that's going on. We also post these on our YouTube page. So if that's where you would prefer to uh, watch these sorts of things, you'll find them there. And would you subscribe to our YouTube page while you're at it? Our Daily Shelter returns next week on Tuesday to talk about what happens when a denominational split is postponed with our very own Bishop David Bard. The United Methodist Church was scheduled to meet for general conference in May of 2020, actually just a couple weeks ago, to work out what appeared to be a split over human sexuality. But because of the pandemic, general conference has been postponed until 2021. So what's happening with our denominational split? Well, Bishop David Bard will help us understand what it means for General Conference to be postponed um, while that conversation about human sexuality continues. Right now, I think we all need to connect with something bigger than ourselves. So we wanna encourage you to connect with God and others at Stickamore Creek. Stay connected with us and always be in the know about opportunities to connect through our digital connection card. If we've done our zoom jujitsu correctly it'll just pop up in another frame jeremy's got that when this is over or if you're on facebook you can just follow that link sycamorecreekchurch.org connect don't shelter alone connect with others and god at sycamore creek Friends, you've been watching Our Daily Shelter, a daily-ish live interactive video podcast and ministry of Sycamore Creek Church in Lansing, Michigan. In this time of sheltering in place, we think it's important to connect with the community. So find community every Sunday at 1 p.m. in a live interactive worship event at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash slworship. That stands for South Lansing Worship or every Monday night in a church-wide video chat open to everyone at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash allchat. You can connect with us and we can connect with you through our digital connection card found at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connect. Submit prayer requests here on this topic or really any topic or by email at prayers at sycamorecreekchurch.org. We've got a team of people who are praying for you daily download and check out our app by searching for SCCMI in your app store and you'll find lots of great resources there including past and current sermons. You can also join the mission of Sycamore Creek by giving financially through the app or at our website sycamorecreekchurch.org. Your generosity helps make resources like Our Daily Shelter available for free. Take a moment and like and follow us on Facebook and share this video with your friends so they can find daily shelter in God's grace too. You may be sheltering in place, but we're here to help you shelter in God's grace. Make your home a shelter of the Most High.